I am Dr. Sandeep Atawal. I am the Director of Lung Transplantation at the Sir HN Reliance uh, Foundation Hospital at Bombay. Uh, we have a large service that primarily uh, looks at the needs of patients with end-stage lung disease, especially when they are oxygen dependent and significantly impaired in their quality of life. Our service caters to these patients and makes sure that we can improve their quality by not just rehabilitation and nutritional enhancement before they end up with a transplantation, but we also provide longitudinal care for many of these patients after surgery so that they can live an enriching life with a new organ. Uh, so how does the team function? Yeah, great question. I think the, the challenge with patients with end-stage lung disease is they need 360-degree uh, care. They do not just need a pulmonologist or an expert in respiratory medicine. They also need intensive care. They need surgeons to be able to help them with some of the challenges that they have when they have end-stage lung disease, like uh, treating them for some of their minor conditions. We also need uh, pulmonary rehabilitation. Uh, dietary uh, uh, requirements are very different in patients with end-stage lung disease. You need an all-round team of expert medical uh, services. Advanced care of patients with end-stage lung disease, including transplantation, requires teamwork. Uh, we have an integrated team here at uh, the Sir HN Reliance uh, Foundation Hospital, largely consists of pulmonologists, intensivists, physicians, surgeons, and uh, uh, support staff in the area of physiotherapy, rehabilitation, and psychological help. Unless we have this 360 degree rounded care, we will never be able to serve patients with special needs, and that's what we are uh, experts at. Uh, the entire focus is to make this a patient journey and try to avoid a lung transplant as far as possible by extending every single possible uh, medical avenue that is available to enhance their life and try to keep them going till they unfortunately need nothing except a lung transplant. Patients with stage lung disease have significant impairment of the quality of life largely because they are nutritionally depleted, they have muscle wasting caused by uh, the ravages of steroids on their body. These patients require a lot of help in the area of strengthening not just their mind but also their frail bodies, teaching them to breathe better by training them in, uh, in various respiratory uh, exercises and using uh, uh, extended rehabilitation service in order to help them mobilize themselves with uh, limited amounts of oxygen on a, on a cylinder, on a portable cylinder. And that's a, that's, that takes a village to do this. Uh, patients need a great deal of attention and uh, some level of expertise in this, unfortunately, is found wanting in most cities in this country because till late, this has been a neglected service all across uh, the world in many ways. Uh, the demands are large and uh, the number of patients that need these kind of services is immense. Uh, ours is a small effort to put uh, things in place in the right direction so that we can help many more patients with end-stage lung disease who require some of these therapies. Patients that require a lung transplant are generally those that are uh, resistant or recalcitrant to medical therapies who are on extended uh, amounts of oxygen uh, every minute and unfortunately are almost completely immobile. The secondary effects of a bad lung can be felt on other organ systems. At this point in time, these patients have no avenue or option except a lung transplant. So once have, having had a successful lung transplant, getting back to normal life and getting into the uh, general population is a definite and a specific challenge for many of these patients. Our attempt is to segue patients through this entire process by making it easier for them. Being part of their families, ensuring that we educate and train uh, uh, support services in their homes to be able to enable them make this transition easily and effectively. And in the medium and long term, our team of specialists uh, have special focus on trying to monitor these patients and their newly transplanted organs, ensuring that we maintain the right levels of immune suppression, keep them away from infection, whether it be viral or fungal, and also ensure that they get the right degree of mobility, nutritional support, and physical enhancement in order to live long and uh, fruitful lives. Our goal is to ensure that our patients after double lung transplant have an average median survival of at least between five to seven years with their new organs which probably matches international standards in many ways. Lung transplantation was a very new specialty in this country for probably a long, long time. It's one of the newest transplants that has been introduced in our nation, while it was done uh, preferentially in the US and in, in Europe. Uh, 
Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, changing times and the stress of COVID has brought this therapy into sharp focus because now it has increased the awareness of end-stage lung disease and the acceptance of patients to be treated with aggressive therapy for some of these problems. Lung transplantation is a very new therapy in our country. While it is standardized in the West, uh, it was for many years that uh, there, were, there were certain doubts and aspersions on the possibilities of lung transplant in our country. Uh, our team is probably the most experienced by a fair measure uh, in this area, having performed more than 400 lung transplants in the past six years. Uh, our effort is to ensure that these patients continue to do well in the long term, and that is probably the key reason why the program is so successful. We currently have an average uh, survival of between five to five and a half years for patients who have been operated very early on in the program. Continue to do extremely well with, uh, uh, with, uh, with a degree of freedom that they would never have anticipated when they went ahead with surgery. Uh, there are newer technologies and newer therapies, including diagnostics, which allow us to monitor these patients without invasive biopsies and tests that would probably require them to be admitted frequently to the hospital. And that we call molecular technology. Uh, our effort is to probably try to increase our, uh, our research in this area uh, with international groups and make sure that our patients lead more uh, comforting and fruitful lives in the long term. So there are a variety of disease conditions that unfortunately end up with end-stage lung disease. This could be smokers, it could be patients who are allergic to certain substances in the environment, including chemicals or probably sometimes even pigeon poop, is, which is considered one of the common reasons for uh, end-stage lung disease. We also have environmental factors like pollution. We also have uh, many genetic disease conditions that could lead to uh, end-stage lung disease, and we have some familial conditions. A collection of many of these diseases are grouped together in a, in a simple term called uh, ILD. Uh, and, and most of these are inflammatory lung diseases of the lung interstitium, which is the supporting mechanism of the uh, breathing cells. Unfortunately, uh, we also have many other disease conditions that could cause end-stage lung damage. For example, smoking, uh, patients who have had advanced tuberculosis, uh, patients who have been uh, exposed to uh, uh, chemical airway injuries, and also many of those patients who have heart defects, which could lead to secondary damages in the lung. So when you look at the entire uh, constellation of lung diseases that would probably lead to end-stage lung failure, we probably have more than four or five dozens of them. Uh, so every single disease has its own uh, way of presenting and a set of therapies that we can use in order to prolong patients' lives before they end up with completely damaged lungs. So every single lung disease has its own set of criteria when we consider that they have a quality of life that is going to be significantly impaired in the next year and their survival is going to be close to, uh, close to uh, zero, where we should deploy such of these therapies when patients still continue to be reasonably well. And for that reason, uh, our, uh, our uh, uh, selection criteria vary from patient to patient. However, the effort is to ensure that we counsel them well, uh, advise them on, uh, uh, on how sick they are, their disease conditions before we make sure that we even uh, think about a lung transplant. Like there are a variety of conditions that require lung transplants, there are various ages at which most of these diseases afflict individuals. Some of them that are genetic could probably be very early in presentation, and that unfortunately includes children who probably have uh, extensive lung damage because of uh, genetic disorders who may require transplant very early on, probably in their, not in their infancy, but at least in their early childhood or probably when they are adolescents. Uh, some of these patients who have inflammatory lung diseases or they have uh, disease conditions like hypersensitive pneumonitis could present at almost any age, right from 20 years to probably 60 to 70 years of age. And there are many disease conditions like uh, bronchiectasis, which is caused by an infective lung condition or by advanced tuberculosis. We have disease conditions like cystic fibrosis, which can probably present in somewhere in the mid-30s and 40s. However, having said that, every single individual who turns up for a lung transplant because of bad lungs, uh, unfortunately has a set of challenges that are brought about by the disease condition itself and its impact on, on other organs of the body, also by some of the medications that we use to treat these patients with these disease conditions in the first place. So assessing every individual with a specific disease condition with a variety of tests and understanding their physiology or uh, how they respond to this disease 
and what is their physiological or their body reserve is very important for us as a team to tailor therapy in order to deploy the right treatment at the right point in time, leading to good outcomes. So the transplant evaluation process uh, consists first of trying to figure out the physiological reserve of the damaged lung, because that is extremely important. Understanding whether this lung has reached a stage where it is completely burnt out and will not support human life any longer or beyond a certain, uh, certain period of time, a few weeks or a few months, is extremely important because that is the premise of what we try to do. All the other tests that surround this are largely concerning secondary organ functions in the body. We cannot look at an individual as just an individual who requires a lung transplant. We have to make sure whether he is in the condition to accept a uh, transplanted organ, which comes from someone else, who is genetically not related to him. It's also very important for us to understand whether his body will tolerate the ravages of this operation. Does he require any other medications to get him in better shape? Does he require nutritional enhancement, physiotherapy? Does he require psychological counseling to put him in the right frame of mind? These are very, very important questions because they do not just deal with an operation. They also deal with the long-term outcomes and the welfare of this patient and his family. When someone comes in for a transplant, they not just put their life's earnings, they also invest their lives in your hands and they trust you. And breaking that trust is unfortunately not the way of conducting medicine in the right sense. Our goal at the Sir H. N. Reliance Hospital is to ensure that patients have that level of trust with us because we are committed to the process of treating them. And that is our commitment as an individual and an organization here. So every individual is taken through these set of tests and while those reports are awaited, patients continue to be on rehabilitation and nutritional therapies in order to improve their qualities of life. And while the, the team reports are assessed and discussed among experts uh, in the lung transplant committee, finally giving a recommendation to patients allows us to be able to streamline their therapy and time their transplant. Uh, well, every single effort is made to keep them in the best physical shape in order to not just undergo the transplant, but recover quickly from the operation. This is an extremely, extremely tenuous, long and uh, critical procedure. And uh, uh, it, it, there is never any way of guaranteeing success other than sticking to a process, uh, which, is, which includes a lot of discipline and a lot of technical knowledge that is uh, specific to this disease condition. Generally, most individuals who require a lung transplant are uh, adults. And unfortunately, when an adult, adult needs a lung transplant and definitely needs a dual lung transplant, that's a double lung transplant, uh, the donor has to be from a deceased uh, donor organ only. Uh, we cannot generally have uh, uh, living related donations uh, for patients who require lung transplant except small children or babies. Fortunately, in our country, we have extremely small number of these patients or this patient population that actually allows us not to worry too much about this uh, disease presentation and, and besides that, there are many newer medicines, especially of the inhaled variety that allow us to treat some of these children who are very young with these conditions and ensure that they can probably be bigger or slightly closer to adulthood before they require that final therapy. So in our country, the options for a lung transplant continue to be from a deceased organ donor only. We do not consider live donations for any individual who requires a lung transplant. So generally, anyone who requires a lung transplant would either have uh, uh, two presentations. One is they would be either oxygen dependent, unable to walk more than a few paces in, in a few minutes. Uh, uh, the, the, the immediate possibilities of, of exhibiting desaturation or a drop in oxygen saturation the minute they try to even uh, 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 do a, a small degree of exercise. The inability to eat get breathless or get uh, uh, full as soon as you have a few morsels of a meal. Uh, these are general symptoms for most of these patients, other than the fact that they are almost completely bedridden or bedbound or homebound by that very nature. So these are patients who end up having lung transplant uh, as far as the general constellation of syndromes is concerned. But post lung transplant, these very patients would be probably able to walk at least six to 700 meters within five minutes at a moderate to fast pace. They would be able to climb at least one or two steps of uh, a flight of stairs. They should be able to uh, go around for a, uh, for a trip in the park with their family. They would be able to fly uh, uh, on an airplane with the requisite precautions. 
However, this is the independence that they would achieve as far as their relief after a lung transplant. But most importantly, every organ that is transplanted belongs to someone else. And it is important for not just the family, the patient, and also the treating team to realize that this organ is covered by an invisible invisibility cloak, uh, and, uh, and that is created by using medications. Any breach in the invisibility cloak can lead the organ to be detected by the uh, recipient's body, and that could lead to a process we call rejection. Our goal is to ensure that we keep that cloak on all the time to be able to ensure that patients continue to live productive and fruitful lives with a newly transplanted organ. So this is a, this is a very, uh, I would say, it is like a ballet. It is between uh, two individuals who, uh, who are well-trained, who understand the nuances of, of dancing together and execute it perfectly. So uh, it is always between the treating team and the patient himself who understands the critical nature of his transplant and the, and the discipline that he needs to exhibit in order to live a good and long productive life. So uh, uh, World Heart Day. Uh, well, uh, I can only say this, that in India there is a, uh, there is a large number of patients with end-stage heart failure. Unfortunately, it is, uh, its number is significantly underestimated simply because we do not have uh, collection uh, agencies that could uh, collate data. Uh, we, we seriously do not have uh, a census that looks at uh, uh, patients in this category. We largely depend upon information that comes in uh, to us from uh, primary healthcare centers, probably from pharmaceutical industry, and from the, uh, the consumption of uh, drugs of a specific nature. Uh, Long-term surveillance of many of these patient populations is difficult. Uh, however, it is important to understand that India is a young country with a young population and with changing lifestyles and uh, lack, of, uh, lack of activity by most individuals who are busy with building their career, obesity is on the rise, uh, diabetes in the in the young is on increase and hypertension is is fairly common uh, the stress of uh, uh, living a corporate life is increasing in many young individuals in this country because of the competition that exists for a job and uh, uh, the number of uh, uh, people who are willing to take it uh, all of these are, are societal changes which can cause serious impacts on not just mental but also on cardiac health it is my uh, firm belief that if we can train the youngsters in our country and tell them that these are the risk factors that can lead to heart disease in the long term and make sure that they spend some time uh, in a day uh, to take care of their health, eat healthy, exercise, avoid vices, and uh, make sure that they are happy as, as far as they can are good ways of trying to keep your heart healthy.